We're carrying on in 2 Peter. You, you, know the, you know the setting that Peter's writing from Rome. It's, it's the mid-60s. It's shortly before his execution. And he's writing to, his, his main purpose for writing is to combat certain false teachers that are threatening this group of Christians uh, to whom he's writing. He's got, they're endangering them, and he's on the verge of being executed, but his heart and concern is with what's happening with these Christians. Obviously, he has learned that, the, that these false teachers are there, and these false teachers, they are they're doctrinally and morally corrupt. They denied a future coming of Christ in judgment, and you can see that in a number of places, and they engaged in all manner of sins of the flesh, and these two things aren't uh, isolated, aren't independent of each other. So they're both, they're doctrinally and morally corrupt. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Peter explains that these false teachers, they're devious and deadly. He says that they will negatively influence many people, that they're motivated by greed, and that they certainly will be condemned. So Peter is, is uh, he's coming at them uh, full, full force. Just directly uh, uh, rebuking them and, and warning the Christians about them. He says in chapter 2, verse 4 through the first part of verse 10, there he exposes as a lie this claim of the, of the false teachers, this claim or suggestion of theirs that God will allow rebellion and sin to go unpunished. See, they're selling this notion that, that uh, there's not going to be a judgment. You don't need to be concerned about living in sexual immorality and those kinds of things. Don't worry about it. And he exposes that as a lie by explaining to them and reminding them that God in the past, there are many examples of God's judgment of sin in the past. He says that, you know, there were these rebellious angels that God uh, judged. God certainly judged the, uh, the wicked world of Noah's day. He judged the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And his point is, so why should anybody think, along with these false teachers, what they're trying to sell... Why should anybody think that the false teachers and their followers will not likewise be judged? And so that's the function of those examples that he gives. Then in chapter 2, the second part of verse 10 through 16, he rebukes the false teachers uh, for their arrogance and mocking and ridiculing the spiritual forces of evil. He says, look, even the faithful angels, the faithful angels who are more powerful than these fallen angels, even they do not underestimate the power of these fallen angels and speak dismissively or derisively of them. They don't do that. And yet here are these people, presumably when somebody comes up to them and says, listen, by your advocating an immoral lifestyle, what you're doing is you're playing into the hands of these spiritual forces of evil. Then they just speak mockingly of these spiritual forces of evil, not realizing that they are being bagged by these forces of evil. And he says that these, the, the faithful angels don't speak that way dismissively or derisively of them. He analogizes the false teachers to unreasoning, unreasoning animals that lack the intelligence to avoid capture and destruction. They are completely oblivious to the fact that they are on the way to destruction. They're just like, you know, just like ignorant animals. Yet they would hold themselves out to be the epitome of intelligence and depth and all that. But he, he analogizes them to unreasoning animals. He says the false teachers are shameless in their sin. And they continue living in sin while identifying with the church. They're constantly on the prowl for partners in adultery. You see, the, these people are shameless. Because their ideas, they're pushing the notion that, listen, uh, there's no problem with it. There's no recompense for it, no judgment for it. And so they're just shameless. And in broad daylight, he says, they don't care. You know, they'd sit there and say, you got a problem with that? you got a problem with that? That I'm on the prowl for a partner in adultery. But that's what he, he says, that, and he tells, says that they have their hearts trained in greed. These heretics, he says, they follow Balaam's way of disobedience to God for the sake of financial gain. So somehow they're benefiting from all this. And you can see how that would work. We don't have all those details. That's how it is when you're, in one sense, reading somebody else's mail. You see, in another sense, of course, this is the word of God to the church for all ages. But there are things that we aren't privy to, so exactly how is this working? But you can speculate and you can imagine. Well, how are they turning this into money? Well, people like hearing this. 
Turn on the television. I hear people selling all kinds of nonsense, and the place is full. And they've got all kinds of money, bazillions of dollars, building all kinds of things. And they're saying things that I think uh, most people could recognize if they would pay attention or... or Uh, seriously off base. Okay, when we ended last week, we were looking at chapter 2, verses 17 to 22. I want to pick back up there, say a little bit more, as I typically do. I'll repeat some of the things that I said, and then we'll go ahead and move on. But in chapter 2, verses 17 to 22, he says, these men are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved. For while uttering high-sounding words of nonsense, they entice with lusts of the flesh, acts of licentiousness, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error, promising them freedom while themselves being slaves of corruption. For by what someone has been overcome, to this he has become enslaved. For if after escaping the pollutions of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are overcome by again becoming entangled in these things, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it was better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn from the holy commandment that had been passed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after being washed to wallowing in the mud. Okay, he tells him, Peter says through the use of these two metaphors, he says that these false teachers, they promise people the refreshing and life-giving truth of God. That's what they purport to have. That's what they claim they they have. So over here is the the refreshing and life-giving truth of God. But he says anyone who comes to them expecting to receive that will be bitterly disappointed. You see, you're going to be, they're like waterless springs. You go to these springs saying, ah, you know, I'm dying of thirst. Oh, there's a spring. And you go there and eh, bone dry. That's how these false teachers are. They claim to be having the, to have the truth of God. But anybody who goes to them for that truth is going to be disappointed. He describes the judgment that's in store for them as the gloom of darkness. Now, they will, they will suffer eterni- eternally in a dreadful environment away from the presence of God and all that is good, shut out from the presence of all that is good. Now, that's hard for us to imagine. But in however you cut the symbolism that God has of this state throughout Scripture, it is the ultimate bummer. Okay? You cannot escape that. You don't picture things as weeping and gnashing of teeth, as fire, as darkness, as being cast out from the presence of God forever. You don't picture that any way other than this is a place no sane person wants to go. So he tells them here that this is their, this is their fate. This idea of gloom, the gloom of darkness. And he says they will endure that fate because they're opposing God by luring immature Christians, those barely escaping the pull of the world, into a lifestyle of sexual sin. That is what they're doing. They are saying here, I have a theological justification for you to engage in sexual sin. Come with me. And people are going, whoa, that's great. You see, these people over here, they're saying that Christ calls you to holiness of life. Well, you can't engage in sexual immorality. This guy's saying, that's not true. Mm. <laughs> you see, so what are they doing? They're pulling people. And I think about that. You say, well, well how does that relate today? Certainly, it, it, there is the world pulls us that way. But I was thinking that, you know, people in, in so-called churches that, you know, wear the name Christ, groups that wear the name Christ, that have people teaching them that it is perfectly fine to engage in homosexual conduct, for example. This is out there. You see, periodically you'll have groups, oh, this is a, yeah, there's, there's great turmoil in the Anglican communion because we have this group that is, you know, ordaining, practicing homosexuals. Well, what are they saying? They are saying to people, the truth of God is that that doesn't matter. That's what they were doing. You see, what they were saying was, no, no, I have the insight, I have the truth, come this way and join me in hunting for partners in adultery. You see, this is how they do it. And so he says that you are luring people who are just escaping from this into a lifestyle of sexual sin. 
And they're doing that because they have a theological rationale that they've worked out and they're feeding that to people. And they're saying, okay, they're, they're, they're attracting people. Now the false teachers, they probably supported their case for freedom from moral restraints. They're saying, see, no, no, you can be free. They're teaching freedom to people. The freedom of moral restraints. And they probably supported that case by denying Christ's return and the future judgment that's associated with that return. They, they, they just poo-pooed that idea. Just mock the no, 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 there's not going to be that accounting, there's not going to be that return. You don't want to listen to those people, they're just saying that to you so they can control you. You see, that's what they're doing. They're just using that to control you. You know how these religious leaders are. They're control freaks. But you listen to me, you see, and it's all free, baby. It's all free. So they no doubt are saying that they're using in part the idea, their denial of the return of Christ in judgment... But also, no doubt, they're using, they're distorting Paul's gospel of freedom. And you can see that in chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But they wouldn't be the first to do that. The idea that a person is saved by grace through faith, not by works, you see, can easily be transformed into something that says it doesn't matter how you live. It can be twisted into that. And people did that with Paul, and Paul would say, listen, if, you know, why don't we you know, let us sin so God, grace may abound. He says, what are you, crazy? That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. But you can see how somebody could take that and turn it that way, right? And so this is partly what they're doing, and we'll talk about that in a bit later, or probably next week. Now, this appeal, it's wrapped up in high-sounding nonsense, you see, which is all, all too often uh, is able to draw the gullible. This is what, while uttering high-sounding words of nonsense. They don't come in, I've told you this ad nauseum, they don't come in, heretics don't come in and say, I'm a heretic. I'm a heretic, I don't know anything. They don't do that, they come in and say, yeah, yeah yes, yes, I know this, yes, I'm aware of this, but, uh, but I've transcended that. You see, I have gone beyond that in my brilliance and depth. You see, this is how... So, they, you know, they, they have the way wrapping stuff up in high-sounding nonsense. And so you have, that has to be penetrated and has to be, uh, has to be pierced. Peter elaborates further on their condemnation by explaining that their, their repudiation of their conversion to Christ by returning to the sinful lifestyle from which they had escaped at the time of their conversion, it makes them worse off than somebody who never converted. Now this ought to be sobering. It makes them worse off than somebody who never converted. You see, it would have been better for them to never have converted, to never have entered the way of righteousness than to have converted and turned from the holy commandment that was passed on to them. The commandment, the call to walk in faithfulness to Christ. You see, that had been passed on to them that when you say yes to Jesus Christ, you are called to walk in faithfulness to Him. And what did they do? They had turned their back on Him. So He says it would have been better for them never to have entered the way of righteousness than to have done so and then turned around after that and said... That's what I think of you and your salvation and your crucifixion and everything else. It's about me, baby. I'm doing what I want to do. I'm the king. I make the rules. You get out. You see, so he says it would have been better for them not to have known it. Their situation is worse than one who never converted. You say, well, how can that be? He doesn't explain how that can be, but what I think he's talking about is that they will for eternity know that they had at one time known the grace and mercy and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had been saved, and they had chosen to turn their back on that salvation for the fleeting glitter of sin. They will live with that for eternity. Not simply that they knew about Him, but that they had been saved. They had been on the way of righteousness. They had known His love, His mercy, the fellowship of the church. They had known all that, and what had they done? They said, this sin, I want to choose sin. Yes, 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 I know all that, I know all that. But hey, do you know how much fun this is? Do you know what this is like? I'm going to choose this, and they will forever know that. Forever they will have that. I remember many years ago, this is a bit different, but I was talking to somebody where I worked, and we were talking about Hurricane Camille, 
And this guy told me, he, he was a, you know, kind of a quasi-believer. He used to come down and mess with me, and he'd ask me, say, uh, hey, what's new in the world of religious fanaticism? That was his comment to me. <laughs> he said that because I believe the Bible, you see. But he purported to. But as I could tell, he apparently hadn't read it. Uh, but in any event, he'd come down, and we were talking one day about uh, Hurricane Camille. And when they, this hurricane just completely destroyed these apartments, that they, they'd been begging these people to leave, and they were throwing a party to welcome the hurricane. And when they went back, the entire apartment complex was gone. And we were talking about that, and he said, yeah, you know what would have been the worst thing? Is that right at that moment, when either the walls were cracking or you were, he said, they would have known they could have avoided it. Yeah. And I said, ah, <laughs> ah, isn't that the truth? And see, I think that's what's part of this. They will live for eternity knowing, I had it. I had the mercy of God. But no, I wanted to go over here. And so they'll live with that. And I think that he doesn't explain all that, but that's, you got my guess on that. Now, the false teachers are examples of a proverbial statement that this was a modification and an expansion of the first part of Proverbs 26.11. It's, it's in this time, it's one proverb, it's a proverbial statement, and he says, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after being washed to wallowing in the mud. See, in, in returning to the moral corruption of the world, after having been cleansed by Christ and delivered from that filth, after having been cleansed and delivered from that filth and then returning to it, they're like a dog that returns to its vomit. And a washed sow that goes back to wallowing in the mud. That's pretty high on the rebuke scale, isn't it? I mean, to me, that's getting up there with whitewashed tombs. You see? And there are times when this has to be said. There are times, you know, here they are there. Now, what are they doing? They're out here just, you know, rushing to commit adultery. You know, we are fornication is their byword. And they seem proud of it. And they're luring people who seem to think that's the way to go. That's really a good idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, come on, come on. And, they, and the Spirit of God and Peter just saying, this is what I see as a dog returning to its vomit. They were delivered from that. They were empowered to conquer that. And what happened? Back to it. Back to it. This clean sow just says, no, baby, I got to get back over here in this mud. I got to wallow in the mud. Okay, so as I say, that's, that's pretty high on the rebuke scale. Then he says in chapter 3, you never thought we'd get to chapter 3, but here we are. <laughs> chapter 3, he says, This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I arouse your pure intention with a reminder to remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days scoffers will come with scoffing, proceeding according to their own lusts and saying, where's the coming, of, where's the promise of his coming? For from which time the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as from the beginning of creation. For this is concealed from them wishing concealment, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed from water and through water, through which things the world then existing, having been deluged with water, perished. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Now Peter, he mentions that this is his second letter to them. As I've said before, first Peter may have been his first letter. Okay, that, that's certainly possible, maybe even probable. That first Peter was the first letter. But it's also possible that he's, he's alluding to a letter that God chose not to preserve. Like the letter that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. So you can't be certain that he's talking about first Peter. He may be talking about first Peter. But clearly he had written to them before. Now Peter wants to arouse their pure intention by having them recall this prophetic word about the Messiah's coming in judgment. The, the prophetic word he had referred to in chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. He had talked about that prophetic word. The Old Testament prophets who had, into, who had stated about Christ's coming in judgment. 
And so he sits here and he wants, to, he wants to arouse their intention by having them recall that prophetic word. That yes, the Messiah is coming in judgment. These people are saying he's not coming in judgment, that there's not going to be an accounting. That things are just going to keep on rolling along, just like it always has, just keeping on. He says, you remember that prophetic word, that Messiah is coming in judgment. And he also wants them to recall Christ's insistence that they live righteously as disciples, see which command their apostles had passed on to them. That Christ's insistence that they live righteously, as Jesus made clear in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes absolutely clear that those who are participants in God's revolutionary activity, God is doing something in this world. He calls people to join His revolution. You know, if that's got cachet when you're talking about revolution, overthrowing some government or something, you know? Yeah, what do you know? The revolution, man, we're into it. Down with it. Well, God's got a revolution. And He calls us to join it. And when we join it, when we say yes to the King, we are called to a lifestyle of radical commitment and righteousness. That's what, read the Sermon on the Mount. And don't read it keeping saying to yourself, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. Read it as the ethical call of God in your life. To love your neighbor, love people, do this. Not to just do for those who do for you. You see, it's a radical call. That's why when we read it, we're looking for a way out from under it. You telling me I can live perfectly? Look, I'm so tired of answering that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I know, I understand, sinful. But I will not allow that to gut the call to righteousness in the Bible. Okay, we are called to righteousness. And that's what he's saying here to these people. See, he wants to, rem to remember, see, that Christ's insistence to live righteously as disciples that your apostles had passed on to you. He says, your apostles... Because he's referring to the particular apostles who had evangelized and taught the audience he's writing to. <clears throat> See, in other words, that, that subset of apostles that had evangelized and taught them, it clearly included Paul, because he says in chapter 3 that, that Paul had written them at least one letter, but it doesn't exclude Peter. But when you say, why does he refer to your apostles? He's doing it because he's speaking of a subset of all the apostles. Okay, so don't don't... Uh, get hung up on that. Now he indicates that they are seeing in the false teachers a fulfillment of earlier predictions that mockers would arise in the last days. See, this is something that mockers are going to come. And for the sake of their lust, they're going to be mocking. Well, that's these people. You see, these people are the mockers. New Testament writers emphasize that the last days had begun with Christ's redemptive work. You see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, and a number of other places. You see that the last days had begun with his redemptive work, and the false teachers, they were people who, while indulging their own lusts, what did they do? They scoffed at the idea of Christ's return in judgment. They mocked it. So here they are, scoffers, based on their lust, and these two things go together. Indulging lust and denying judgment, it's like a marriage made in hell. You see, this is it. And so here they are, scoffing at the very idea that Christ would return in judgment. They asserted, you see, that the physical world, it had always been characterized by continuity and stability. Right? I mean, look, he says, For from which time the fathers fell asleep, everything continues as from the beginning of creation. You see, their idea, their cell, was that, look, the physical world, it's, it's always been characterized by continuity and stability, and so it is utterly foolish to expect the kind of radical transformation of the world that was taught would occur in conjunction with Christ's return. These people, these apostles who are saying that at Christ's return, there is going to be the ultimate makeover of this creation. That's crazy. Everything goes on with regularity, 
stability. Since the beginning, it just marches this way. And he says, these people, that's, that's what they're talking about. So they're saying, listen, it's foolish. Given the stability and continuity that has always existed, it's absolutely foolish for you to think that stability and continuity will be broken when Christ returns. Which they deny. Right? So this is, this is what they're saying. Now, because of their desire for sin, you see, for this is concealed from them wishing concealment. Right? you got to have eyes to see, right? Ears to hear. I mean, even Paul Simon said a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. Right? So this is what they're doing. They are selling something that is clearly contradicted by Scripture. It's concealed from them wishing concealment. Why? Because they don't want to see that. He says that this is concealed from, the, from them wishing concealment. See, and what they, they choose to be unaware of or unappreciative of the fact God, by His Word, previously had had a dramatic effect on the physical world. He had previously, by His Word, had what? He had had a tremendous effect on the physical world. So these people saying that, no, it's always like this, so you're foolish to expect any kind of radical transformation of reality at the return of Christ. That's nonsense. Everything just keeps going on as it always has been. He said they're just, they're just ignoring the fact that previously, in the past, the Word of God, He's had a dramatic effect on the physical world. By that Word, God brought into being the heavens. There were no heavens. It wasn't just going along for eternity. There were no heavens. God spoke the heavens into being. He brought them into being, and He says, and He formed the earth from water and by water. You see, in the sense that he made the dry land from under the water by gathering the water into what is called seas. So what do we have? We have water, and what does God do? He brings land from underwater by gathering the water into seas. So he says, how did he do that? He did it by his word. He did it by his powerful word. He's probably emphasizing water in the creation account. Because of the following clause, see, that deals with the flood, which is what? It is a reversal of the making of land. So here he has here, he brings, he, he, he brings land from underwater by gathering the water into seas. And then what happens in the flood? He reverses the process. You see, he completely inundates the land. And I think that's why he's bringing up water here like that. Through that same word and water... You see, he says, it's concealed from them wishing concealment that the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed from water and through water. Through which things? Through the word and the water. Through which things the world then existing, having been deluged with water, perished. A worldwide cataclysmic judgment. Involving everybody. The whole world was taken up in this thing. And he says that the world here perished, and that same mighty word that dramatically affected the physical world in the past has reserved the present heavens and earth for fire in the day of judgment. He says, so this idea, this, this selling point of the false teachers that no, 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 uh, don't expect this kind of radical transformation these people are selling in conjunction with the coming of Christ. I'll show you that's stupid because all things have gone on as they always have. They said, well, these guys are blind to a couple of things. They're blind to the fact it hasn't always gone on that way, has it? Right? There were no, there were no heavens. God created earth from water and by water. So his word has had a tremendous and powerful effect on the physical world in the past. So the idea that he's not going to do it in the future is nuts. The future, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire in the day of judgment. And so he wants them to see these guys, he's trying to strengthen them against what they're selling. They're pulling them and appealing to them this way. And he's countering that. And he wants them to understand it. Because he's going to be dead before long. And he wants them to be able to hold on to that. Okay, he says in 3.8.10, he says, But do not let this one thing be concealed from you, beloved. 
That with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow concerning the promise, as some regard slowness, but is patient toward you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, at which time the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be dissolved by being burned up, and the earth and the works in it will be exposed. Hey, Peter here, he, he cautions his readers not to allow the apparent slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of it. They're decades down the road at this point. We're millennia down the road. And the point applies. He doesn't want them to allow the slowness of Christ's return to become a cause for doubting the certainty of it. He tells them that God operates in his own dimension or perspective of time. Does that, does that bother us? I mean, he made it. He operates in his own framework. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. So here we are going, you know, we're marking on. The Lord says, listen, I, I look at this from a different standpoint, a different dimension, a different perspective. You see, I do that. You cannot, so he can't be judged, you see, by human perceptions of slowness. He is not subject to that judgment because he looks at things from his own perspective or dimension. So as you sit here and try to say, 30 years? What, are you crazy? 30 years? You think he's coming? Go ahead, come on, man. Everything just goes on the way it always does. He's not coming. He's not coming. It's not going to happen. And he says, listen, don't you allow the slowness of that return, as some regard slowness, to cause you to doubt the certainty of it. Douglas Moo in his commentary says, God views the passage of time from a different perspective than we do. We are impatient, getting disturbed and upset by even a short delay. God is patient, willing to let centuries and even millennia go by as he works out his purpose. We say, I can't do that. Oh, he can. <laughs> Days like a thousand years. A thousand years like a day. He's letting them see, what are these guys doing? They're trying to parlay that delay into an asset for their, their uh, sales pitch. You see, that's what they're doing because they deny this and they're trying to say, listen. And he says, don't you be sucked in by that. Don't you be taken in by that. Okay, the Lord is not slow in fulfilling the promise of Christ's return in the sense, in the, sense the passage of decades and now millennia does not have the connotation that the false teachers apparently attach to it. He's not, he, God is not slow concerning the promise as they regard slowness. See, he's not slow as they regard slowness, as they interpret as not having already sent Jesus back. They have a connotation they attach to that. Their idea is he hasn't sent him back already, he's not coming back. And he says he's not slow as they regard slowness. Rather than indicating an intent to leave everything the way it is, just keep going, all things. Rather than an indication to, to leave things as they are, it's a reflection, what does he say, of God's deep concern for human beings. That's what it's about. For in God's patience, he's waiting for people to repent before it's too late. Because when he comes, it's too late. It's too late. So if you want to say anything about the graciousness of this so-called delay, then we can wind up saying, thank God for it, because it's an indication of his love for human beings. And he says, listen, don't be taken in by that. However long God chooses to wait before sending Jesus, he is definitely going to send him. Peter emphasizes that certainty. You can't see this in a translation. But he emphasizes the certainty by placing the verb will come in Greek. He puts it at the beginning. Now, you can't translate it that way. It looks stupid. But he puts it at the beginning, and he does that to make it emphatic. You see, he's coming. And the church always lives in the expectation of his coming. He's coming. He emphasizes that God is patient, but the day of the Lord will come, and it will come like a thief, meaning at a time not specified beforehand. The thief doesn't, he doesn't make an appointment to come. He doesn't say, I'm coming at 2.30, okay, at your house. 
It's not specified beforehand. But he's coming in God's time. He's coming in God's time. Now at Christ's return, creation will get the ultimate makeover. It will pass through the purifying fire that he refers to in verse 7. The heavens is presently constituted. They will pass away in the roar of a cosmic conflagration. And the elements, not the atomic elements, although he could do that if he wanted. It's just that he's not talking about the atomic elements. The elements meaning the stuff of which the physical things of this world are made. What, what constitutes them? You don't have to take it all the way down to the atomic elements. But he says the stuff of which these, the physical things of the world are made will be burned up. See, and somewhere in connection with that process, all that has transpired on the earth, he says, and the works in it will be exposed. All that has transpired on the earth will be laid bare before God in the judgment. It's going to be just laid out there. Everything that has happened will be exposed and set plainly before God in the judgment. And then he says in verses 11 to 13, Since all these things are thus being dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be with regard to holy forms of conduct and godly deeds while awaiting and hastening the coming coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved by being set on fire, and the elements will melt by being burned. But in accordance with his promise, we are awaiting a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Now he says, look, given the certainty of the final, consummating, history-ending judgment that he's described, what kind of people should they be with regard to godly living as they expectantly wait for and hasten that day? What kind of people should you be? Well, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. They're to be, they're, they are to be people who live godly lives so as to be on the desirable side of that coming. He says if this is how it's all going to be, which it is because he's speaking by the Spirit of God, then how should you live? Should you be God? Should you be the one who lives? Uh, uh, I just want to live the way I want to. I don't like like rules and I don't like anybody over me and I don't want to have to do... You know, I want to be God! I want to be God and I want to live the way I want to. He says, given the reality of the judgment that is coming that I've described, how should you live? How does a sane person live in light of what I've just told you? Whether to live godly lives... You see, lives that reflect their allegiance to God. Right? I mean, isn't that, it, when you and I turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and we say, I'm yours, isn't there fruit of that? If that's genuine? I mean, can we think of any other place where like I join the revolution? We're going to overthrow some government? And you can't tell it in my life? No, I'm, I, I'm in with the people. We're all, you know, like, yeah, I cast my lot, blood brothers. You know, we're into this. And then you follow me around and it just, it, there's no indication of that commitment in my life at all. Well, this is what he's talking about. You see, a person who is Christ, that is manifested in our lives. Our lives reflect our allegiance to Christ. So this is what he goes, how should you live then? You should live as somebody who's a true believer. Somebody who really meant it when they said Yes. So that there will be these indications and one will be on the desirable side of that judgment. Living by the standards of this fallen world, that's a fool's move. Okay, it's a fool's move because you're aligning yourself with the old age and the old order that is what? It is doomed to destruction. That's what's getting weeded out and punished. All that is contrary to the eternal perspective of God is being taken. So why would you want to cast your lot with that? Yet there are plenty of voices. Our culture's full of them. Our culture's after all the young folks. Constantly telling them, true life is over here. This is where, you know, you don't want to be hanging out with those old stodgy church people. You know, they all got, they're all, they're nothing but, they got hang-ups. You see, we're free, baby. They got hang-ups. You see, so what is that pull? 
That is a pull to come cast your lot with the world. And the Spirit of God through Peter is saying, that's crazy. Now, who are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to Peter? Or are you going to listen to some guy on ABC? Right? That's what, it, that's what he's saying. He says, this is absolutely insane. Now, Peter doesn't explain here how disciples can hasten the coming of God. I don't know if you caught your attention. But it's an interesting little idea. Now, my guess is, is that he has in mind the endurance of the persecution and suffering that come with living for God in a sinful world. That's part of why, you know, the idea of, you say, listen, if I cast my lot with Jesus Christ, well, he was crucified. If he's my Lord, the world didn't take kindly to him. He wound up getting crucified. So that's part of the pull that you say, well, maybe, you know, these people are offering something else. But he, say, he says, look, you know, that, that in this idea of hastening, I think what he's talking about is this persecution and suffering that come with, with living for God. You remember that he, Peter's what? Peter's on the verge of being executed, right? So he knows a little bit about persecution. And his, if, if First Peter is the letter he wrote to them, which it may well be, that was loaded with talk about being faithful in persecution. You've probably forgotten that already. But it is. <laughs> it's loaded with this idea of, look, persecution, persecution against the faithful, and you need to be faithful, 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 faithful. Okay, so I think what he has in mind here is, is enduring this persecution and suffering. You say, well, how does that relate to a hastening of the second coming, a hastening of the day of God? And I think the idea is that in, in texts like Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it seems there that there is a set quantity of Christian suffering that will occur before his return. You know, that till the full number. He's talking there about martyrs. But if I take that concept, you see, of a full number, that there is a set quantity of suffering, of righteous suffering, of Christian suffering before Christ's return. So then with each... That's the second one? Okay, we'll pick up uh, next week, Lord willing. Thanks. <laughs> All right, you see that bell? It just gets you in trouble.